Today is the 100th anniversary of the certification of the 19th Amendment, which secured women's right to vote. What you may not be aware of is that women actually won the right to vote in school elections in Kentucky uh, eight years earlier, in 1912, and that a local race for superintendent in Anderson County in 1913 actually resulted in a precedent-setting court case that upheld that right to vote. Um, and that paved the way for the largest number of women that have ever been elected to that point as superintendent in the history of the state. Um, so at most points since 1838, certain women in Kentucky had been able to vote in school elections. These were typically widowed women and single women that had children in their household that were school age. Women had been allowed to serve as superintendents since 1886. And they, a considerable number of them, as you can see here, had been elected in every election cycle uh, since then. But these were done by all male electorates as opposed to uh, women being able to vote. In 1894, uh, the legislature passed legislation that allowed women in second class cities to vote in school elections. And um, that included Lexington, Covington, Newport. They had that right for uh, about eight years. During that time, a large number of African-American women voted, and African-Americans at that time were predominantly Republican, and this threatened the Democratic control of Lexington, and the party bosses went to Frankfurt and had the law repealed in 1902. And so women lost that right that they had won in 1894 in 1902. In 1908, widowed women became disenfranchised. And so there was a period of time in there until 1912 when uh, women were not voting at all. In it was not until 1912, though, that really all qualified women in Kentucky uh, had the right to vote in school elections and serve as superintendents of schools. School suffrage was not a new thing in 1912 when this legislation was considered. Uh, before the legislature ever met, there were 26 states that had school suffrage with some limitations, but six of those states had full suffrage. Uh, so again, it, it was not uh, like it was a completely new concept. Uh, school suffrage was easier to pass than full suffrage because it didn't require in most states a constitutional amendment. And so it was seen in a lot of cases as a stepping stone to full suffrage. The superintendency might seem like a fairly minor political office, but it was one that controlled a lot of money. And it also involved a lot of political patronage. School superintendents managed large budgets. They collected uh, the tax revenues that came in from railroads, from sheriffs, and with the school board, they selected textbooks, hired teachers and staff for the schools, and they decided about maintenance and construction of school buildings. So there was a lot of money that was under their at least indirect control uh, through the school boards. In a lot of counties, the superintendent's race was often one of the most hotly contested races Winning the, the right to vote in school elections really was no simple matter. The Kentucky Equal Rights Association had fought for years to win school suffrage for women, really since 1902 especially. They had, they had tried to get that right back. But it wasn't until the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs became involved that they really began to make progress toward uh, school suffrage for all women in Kentucky. Uh, CARA was perceived as a a fairly radical organization by many people. And the women's clubs were more mainstream. The, the public was used to seeing them out in public, uh, working in the community, and especially in school-related issues. As early as um, probably 1903, 1904, they had created school improvement leagues in most counties where they had women's clubs. And these leagues went out and worked to improve the buildings and grounds. 
of the schools in the county, which by almost all accounts were in pretty poor condition most places. And so again, the public was used to seeing them dealing with these issues and working in this way. And then locally in Anderson County, the Pyrean Club, which was a women's club, they would be instrumental through the Anderson County Women's Suffrage League, which was an adjunct of their club, uh, in ensuring that women could vote in the first school election in 1913. Women's clubs had to warm up to the idea of school suffrage. At first, it was by no means a unanimous thing for them. Not all women in the clubs wanted school suffrage or suffrage at all. But by 1907, the women's clubs voted to pursue school suffrage, mainly because they, they saw it as necessary to achieve their school reform goals, which included not only the physical plant sort of things we just talked about, but they were also trying to combat low attendance in a lot of schools and high illiteracy rates. Madge Breckenridge, a uh, fairly well-known person here in uh, Fayette County in Lexington, she was the wife of the newspaper editor over here um, and a member of the Breckenridge family, was the chair of the legislative committee of the women's clubs. And so she had worked through her committee to draft a bill for the 1908 legislature, which was known as the education legislature because they did pass so many school and education related reforms that year. They had uh, submitted the bill and the bill had been introduced and showed a lot of promise in the 1908 legislature. It was supported by all the women's groups, two of the major newspapers in the state, the governor, uh, superintendent of public instruction, they were all in favor of it. And uh, so it looked like that it had a lot of promise for passing. It was in the House Committee on Education uh, and it had been reported favorably by that committee. But after it was reported favorably, the committee quickly adjourned, and the chair of that committee was a person named Myers who was thought to be in the pocket of the liquor lobby. And liquor interests were strongly opposed to women's suffrage because women's suffrage was closely aligned with temperance, and temperance, of course, was a threat to the liquor industry. And so they had used their influence in the legislature to... Uh, keep down suffrage bills for quite a while. And it was thought that perhaps that was what was going on here. And sure enough, when the committee came back together, they rescinded their favorable report and transferred to the bill to another committee, and it died in that committee in the 1908 legislature. But again, many other very positive things did come out of that legislature. After the 1908 legislature, uh, the women's clubs came up with whirlwind campaigns, and these were a series of 30 speakers that fanned out across the state to speak about women's suffrage, any venue that they could pretty much uh, get into. And they did this throughout the late part of 1908 and all of 1909. Teachers' institutes were one of their favorite venues in the summers. These were workshops where certified teachers were required to gather. They'd almost always have a speaker. So many times these members of the whirlwind campaign would be one of their speakers. When the 1910 General Assembly came along, the women's clubs had drafted a new bill. They got the assistance of a couple of attorneys to help them. The Education Improvement Commission, which was a state commission on education, and the Kentucky Equal Rights Association all reviewed the bill in advance and approved it. So it, it was thought it would be pretty favorable. Breckenridge again spoke before several committees and actually was given the opportunity to speak on the floor of the house for 10 minutes. And then she was followed in rebuttal by the chair of the committee from 1908 who spoke for 10 minutes against the school suffrage bill. The bill was again defeated in 1910 and again, it was thought that this was because uh, probably of the liquor lobby. Breckenridge and Clay, who uh, Laura Clay was the president of the Kentucky Equal Rights Association, they continued to give speeches after the 1910 legislative session. And in 1911, the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs uh, Legislative Committee actually is said to have sent out over 
100,000 pieces of literature about school suffrage to different important decision makers around the state in an effort to garner support for the 1912 legislature. Anyhow, the 1912 legislature was their third attempt at getting this passed. This time they had the support not only of the new superintendent of public instruction, Barksdale Hamlet, but also of Governor McCreary. McCreary actually in his opening address to the legislature reminded the Democrats in the legislature that part of their platform had been a promise that they would support uh, a school suffrage bill in 1912. The people who introduced the bill did require that they add a qualifier that it could only apply to literate women. And they made no, no bones about it that this was done to keep African American women from voting, that legislators perceived that uh, they would be illiterate and that they would not be able to vote. Uh, but it also excluded a lot of white women and not all black women were excluded by that qualifier either. The bill seemed to pass the, the houses pretty easily and on March 12th, 1912, it was signed by Governor McCreary and women uh, were given the right to vote or won the right to vote would probably be a better way to put it uh, in school elections in Kentucky. 1913 would be the first election where women would be able to vote on school issues. And my research focused on Anderson County, Kentucky, and a precedent-setting legal case that occurred there. There really seems to have been very little discussion about women voting in the county in the 1913 election. It doesn't appear women did vote in the primary. But the day after the Democratic primary in August, the incumbent superintendent of schools in Anderson County was implicated in a question peddling scheme. And question peddling was the illegal sale of the answers to questions on the state teacher's examination to prospective test takers. It was an illegal practice and it had gone on for years in Kentucky. It was a way of making extra money for the people who did it. And it was also a way for local superintendents to circumvent state control over who could become a teacher. It originated with William Cheatham, who was an incumbent, or excuse me, not an incumbent, he was a candidate for superintendent of schools in Washington County. Cheatham had gone to take the test, which was required of all superintendents or candidates for superintendent uh, before they could actually be elected. And after he had taken the test, he got into a conversation with Barksdale Hamlet, who was the state superintendent of public instruction. Don't exactly know what transpired in that conversation, but for some reason, Cheatham confessed to Hamlet that he had actually purchased the answers to the test questions and that he had cheated on the exam. This caused Hamlet to hire a private detective from Louisville, Robert Foster, to investigate what had gone on with Cheatham. And what Foster uncovered was a conspiracy between three candidates for superintendent of schools in Washington County. Um, William Cheatham had purchased the answers to the state exam from Edgar Burton, who was a teacher in a rural school in Anderson County near the Washington County border. Cheatham had studied those answers and used them to, to actually pass the exam when he went to take it. But he had also gone to James Williams, who was one of the other candidates in Washington County, and recruited Williams to sell these questions to other people who might be interested in taking the exam. Williams double-crossed Cheatham and instead went to the incumbent superintendent of schools in Washington County, who was James Bush. And he suggested to Bush that perhaps he could use these answers to the exam questions to expose Cheatham and sabotage his candidacy so that he would drop out of the race and it would just be the two of them running. As a result of this, Cheatham turned state's evidence. And so the Anderson County attorney arrested Edgar Burton and James Williams for their roles in this conspiracy. In questioning Burton 
revealed that he had actually gotten the test questions from Will Baxter, who was the incumbent superintendent of schools in Anderson County. And he confessed that Baxter had been engaged in this practice of question peddling for a number of years. And uh, some of the evidence that the state actually accumulated against Baxter and Burton were letters that had been typed on the typewriter in Baxter's office and some opened uh, envelopes that had contained the answers to the test questions and they should have been sealed. So Baxter was arrested and charged uh, for his role in this conspiracy the day after the Democratic primary in Anderson County. So in the wake of this scandal, Lee Maddox Campbell filed a run for superintendent of schools in Anderson County. Campbell had joined the Anderson County Women's Suffrage League the past summer uh, when Madge Breckenridge spoke at the Teachers Institute. And that's actually when the uh, Suffrage League had been formed. And her friends had encouraged her to run. She was an experienced teacher she had a lot of work and life experiences that you really needed if you were going to be a superintendent. She had taught for over 20 years, most of it in the Lawrenceburg City School System, but she'd also taught for about three years in El Paso, Texas. And the year before deciding to run, she had actually run a private school from her home in Lawrenceburg. While um, a seemingly respected person in the community, well-liked, She'd had an unconventional life, and uh, she'd been involved in several things that had to make her accustomed to being in potentially controversial situations. Earlier in her life, she had married a Catholic at a time when Catholicism was very controversial in the state. Lawrenceburg was definitely a predominantly Protestant town, and Campbell's own family was Protestant. She had also separated from her husband about a year after they married, and this had forced her to work outside the home while caring for a young child that was about a year, year and a half old. And then after an unsuccessful attempt to divorce her husband, she had traveled across the United States alone with her child to El Paso, Texas, where she did have a sister, and eventually to teach in the El Paso School District for uh, like say probably about three years. Campbell also had experience with politics. Her father had been the local jailer and had been elected several times uh, in that office. And her husband, ex-husband, had unsuccessfully run for Spencer County attorney when they were first married. So at the time that Campbell was running for office in 1913, she found herself single with grown children her mother, who had died a couple of years earlier, was no longer in the picture, and she had cared for her mother. So she really lacked a lot of the family responsibilities that might have held back another woman in a similar situation. After declaring her candidacy, Campbell and the president of the Anderson County Women's Suffrage League went to the county clerk's office to request that the county clerk print separate ballots so that women could vote in the general election. Uh, ballots were secret at that time, so nobody knew how you voted. And the ballots contained all the offices that were up for election. So there was no way to really ensure that women only would vote for superintendent unless you had a separate ballot. The county clerk told them that he would need to get the advice of the county attorney and that they should give him a little time and then come back. After a reasonable period of time not hearing from the county clerk, they returned, and they were told that on the advice of the county attorney, the clerk was refusing their request. The Anderson County Women's Suffrage League hired William Marsh, who was a local attorney and also a former member of the city school board, or at least a school trustee, to sue the Anderson County clerk in Anderson Circuit Court to be put on a separate ballot. The county attorney, Frank Rippey, argued at court that women couldn't vote for superintendent because it was not a school office. And this seemed like a fairly baseless argument, and the women quickly prevailed in circuit court. 
Marsh had been in contact with the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. Ms. Clay, along with the K KERA, had told Marsh that if he could get the court case appealed, they would be willing to financially back him because uh, Kara would like to have a precedent setting case that would make it clear women had the right to vote in school elections. They had looked for a case like this for quite a while. There, I believe it had been a case perhaps in Fayette County that had fallen through, it didn't get appealed. And so it didn't work out for them. Marsh had also confided to Clay that he knew that Rippey was vehemently opposed to women's suffrage on a personal level. And so Marsh was able to uh, perhaps manipulate the case in a way that played to Rippey's prejudices. And sure enough, Rippey did appeal the case and was joined in his appeal by the state attorney general. So they appealed the case to the Kentucky Court of Appeals. And in a unanimous decision, the court rejected all of Rippey's arguments and upheld the lower court ruling, finding that qualified women throughout Kentucky did have the right to vote in school elections and to serve as superintendent. And they ordered that Crook print separate ballots for the women. To vote in the general election, you had to register on a specific day before the election. And in Anderson County, that was on October 7th. The Suffrage League canvassed every house in the city of Lawrenceburg uh, in the lead up to that uh, day. And they urged the women that lived there to go and to register and then to follow through and vote in the general election in November. And in the lead up to the general election, uh, speeches were made really throughout the county. We know of at least one case where women debated the issue of women's suffrage in that lead up. And the county attorney, Frank Rippey, he and a former senator in the two days before the general election, they actually visited every precinct in the county and urged all of the voters there to vote the straight Democratic ticket and not to vote for Campbell. Drawing from an account Mrs. Bartlett wrote later about uh, election day, she said that on election day, Campbell's friends used their automobiles to take women to, who could not get to the polls otherwise to the polls so that they could vote. And she was very quick to point out that the women conducted themselves in a very dignified way, which uh, if you know anything about Kentucky elections, men did not always behave well on election day. And that the women were off the streets when the polls closed on election day. Results were not announced until the next afternoon, but when they were announced, it was clear that Campbell had won, and Bartlett says that the women poured into the streets of Lawrenceburg to celebrate. This was not just an Anderson County event. 25 women were elected superintendent in the 1913 election. Some of them for the first time, others were reelected where they had been elected previously by men. And women were able to vote in school elections all over the state, both for women and for men. Campbell became the first woman to ever be elected to public office in Anderson County, which was the case in other counties as well, although there, there were women obviously being reelected in some counties. Baxter and Burton went on trial in March 1914, and Burton pled guilty. And uh, he was sentenced to two to five years in prison for his role in the question peddling scandal. But a couple of weeks later, Governor McCreary pardoned him. And so he really did not serve out his, his time. Baxter, because the evidence for him was obtained from Burton, was acquitted uh, on grounds of insufficient evidence and uh, was never convicted for his role in the conspiracy. You know, the, the local officials had blatantly attempted to disenfranchise women. And I think the reaction of the suffrage league demonstrates the willingness of women to fight for their rights. And the resistance of the local officials reveals the power and control that were at stake in women voting and holding office, uh, even in something as seemingly minor as a school election. The loss of political control over how this significant portion of the electorate might vote was a threat to party bosses of the time. And also, 
it was a threat in terms of the loss of a means of political patronage that came with the superintendent's office. School suffrage only existed for eight years before it was eclipsed by full suffrage. In January 1920, Kentucky became the 24th state to ratify what would become the 19th Amendment. In August, Tennessee became the last state that was necessary to ratify. And the U.S. Secretary of State certified the 19th Amendment 100 years ago today. The 19th Amendment gave women the same voting rights as men. But many minorities still continued to experience a lot of discriminatory voting practices, poll taxes, literacy taxes. Native Americans, through the Snyder Act, were declared citizens in 1924 and gained the right to vote that way. But it really wasn't until the 1965 Voting Rights Act that many of these practices were outlawed. Not to say that they don't exist in other ways today, but at least overtly, uh, those practices were outlawed through that act. Women in schools today outnumber men three to one in K-12 education in Kentucky. Women make up about half of elected school boards. So in that way, they have gained parity. But the percentage of women that serve as superintendents is lower today than it was in 1913. So women have won the right to vote, and it, they're doing well in terms of being elected to school boards in Kentucky, but they continue to be underrepresented in the superintendency. And I think from a policy perspective, this has to cause us to question whether appointed superintendents continue to discriminate against women. Takeaway from this study would be that suffrage was one front in a long battle to enfranchise women. It may have helped to acclimate men to the idea of women being active in public life, but ultimately it was supplanted by full suffrage. Disparities continued to exist in Kentucky in the superintendency. Like women then, women today need to continue to fight against these disparities.